thankful for what I feel this morning. I know the Lord is here with us. Um, I've had this topic on my heart for quite a while and just wasn't wasn't able to quite flesh it out. But um, I feel I feel like um, the Lord has helped me. And so uh, I'm just going to do my best and hopefully it blesses someone. But earlier this week, I asked you to uh, define this class in five words or less. And uh, we got a lot of interesting uh, comments back. I think my favorite was probably a combination of Lisa's and Holly's. Um, I think Lisa said, yo, bada boom, bada bing. And Holly said, life, meat, and potatoes. <laughs> if we could combine the two and just put that outside, that would just aptly de describe this class. But uh, no, we did get a lot of good responses. And uh, interestingly enough, a lot of it pointed to what we talk about in this class. A lot of uh, what you guys said meant to you the most was actually the curriculum uh, that we have here in Connect class. And, you know, I, I, I agree. I, I feel like the curriculum is a big part. But what I feel towards this class is it's like we, we, we come together. We're called the Connect class. And we, we come together. And together as a body, it's like we're constantly just trying to improve one bit after the next. Like, Every, every Sunday, we're just striving to get better, and I'm going to take what I, what I learned from what was taught, and I'm going to apply it to my life. And um, so I, that's what I, I feel like we're all just kind of striving for progress. We're striving for excellence here. And um, as disciples of Jesus Christ, that's our goal. Our goal isn't necessarily perfection, right? right. <laughs> our goal is progress. You know it can't be perfection, um, not from a human viewpoint anyway, because that's unattainable, but rather for this really cool word I came across, it's teleos. Teleos. Um, the human standard of perfection is always unattainable, and it does more harm than good most times right. when we attempt to be perfect. But Jesus does, in fact, call us to be perfect. Matthew 5.48 he said, be ye perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So he's not being unreasonable when he's asking us to be perfect. Um, when we say perfect, we mean faultless, without blemish, something that's flawless, right? Right. But the good Lord's definition is different and a lot better. And that word teleos is the word that is being used when he says Perfect. Um, teleos is the Greek word for perfect, and it means complete, one of integrity and virtue, mature. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Much better. That sounds attainable. That sounds a lot better to me. Teleos. That's what I want to be. My desire is to be made complete in Jesus, mm -hmm. seeking provision nowhere else. My goal is to be a man of integrity and virtuous, someone with moral goodness. I want to be carnally and spiritually mature. Right. I don't want to have the need to be constantly fed or cared for. I want to be mature. I want to be someone with the help of the Lord who can stand on his own two feet, who can be a help and a blessing to someone else. Right. There's an author um, I, I love. His, his name's Jordan Peterson. And one of the things he says when you lose a loved one in life, if you lose a very important family member, be the strong one there for everyone else at the funeral. And, th and that's kind of a heavy statement, but when I think about that, I want to be the strong one. And with the Lord's help, I feel like I can do that. So um, while we might not be able to per uh, attain perfection, I feel like we can attain teleos, which is complete, one of integrity and virtue and mature. And... Um, that's where I feel the heartbeat of this class is. We're always improving, always trying to strive to be a little bit better. And that's what our lessons have been for the past few weeks. When I think about what has been taught over the past several weeks, I mean, um, going back, we had uh, Ashley Diaz. She taught about um, finding our place in the body of Christ, and that is through servanthood. You find your place through having a servant's heart. And then her husband 
courageously followed her up because that was a phenomenal lesson um, he followed her up and he defined what it was to find our place in the kingdom of God by um, upholding the great commandment right brother Roger you know the great commandment it says love the Lord your God right and then like, at, uh, like unto it love your neighbor as yourself and so to find our place in the kingdom, we have to be able to love who God has made us mm -hmm. so that we can love our neighbor, so that we can love God. And we work out that progression. And you taught that, and I don't know if you caught it. I'm sure you did. But Brother Wade said the same exact thing last Sunday. He said, we've got to love ourselves. Right. Not, with a selfish, not with a selfish love, right. but with a love for who God has made us. Right. And uh, tell her it's okay to come in if she's mm -hmm. wanting to come on in this room. Um, let's see who else we had uh, brother um, Josh Benson he taught about having the heart of a servant man it just flowed just having that servant's heart my wife she taught about um, what we speak and how we can speak life and speak uh, powerful things into our lives who else taught oh my goodness last week who was here last week what a phenomenal lesson we had last week with sister beers um, you know uh, just Phenomenal, phenomenal lessons, and uh, I'm very thankful. And that's the heartbeat of our class. We're just, we're just improving more and more each time. But two weeks ago, my wife spoke about the power and authority of our voice, and um, there is another side to that. Um, there is power in what we speak, but she kind of hit on the positive side. But what's been on my heart. Is there's also a dangerous side to what we speak sometimes yes. and our words can be very cutting sometimes and our words can be powerful but maybe in the wrong way sometimes and I, I this lesson is not going to be a negative lesson but it's a it's a it's a challenge to what we speak should I really say that we all agreed last week that uh, we for the most part, we all have struggles with what we say. Sometimes stuff comes out of our mouth that we wish we could take back, and, uh, and we can't. So we have to be very careful, and sometimes our emotions get the better of us. Right? right? right. It happens to all of us. Sometimes we just say things, we're like, oh, my goodness. How many of you have texted something and just, oh, yeah. can I have it back? I <laughs> 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 Yes. I was thinking last week, would it be would it be a good thing and would it be profitable to, to invent an app that gave you like a 30 second grace period yeah. after you take something? <laughs> Do you really want to send this text kind of yeah, thing? It would probably get annoying though sometimes, but we'd probably turn it off after about a week. But anyway, um, so we've got to be careful. And most of us have read the scriptures that say the tongue is a fire. No man can tame it. It's full of poison. Yikes. We also know that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And so maybe the question really needs to ask, be asked, should I really say that? Maybe you should. Maybe it's something that needs to be said. Maybe you need to file that away in the don't ever say this file. But it's just something to think about. And we need to, you know, uh, be cognizant of what is about to come out of our mouth, put some thought behind it, and determine whether or not it, 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 we should let it uh, see the light of day. Have you ever felt so sure that you were right about something? Like you were just absolutely right about this, only to find out that you were dead wrong? <laughs> what what's the mature thing to do when that happens avoid that person for like a month and hope they forget about it right yeah yeah i mean we get there we there are some times at least in my life i feel like i am absolutely right on a subject only to turn around and find out that i am wrong we good yeah okay and um God, that's just, that's a tough spot to be in because we like being right and it's tough when we find out that we're wrong. And uh, I can remember, this was a long, long, long time ago. Me and my wife just celebrated uh, 16 years of marriage last Thursday. 
And I was brought back in time to probably the first year we were married. And um, we were sitting on the platform at church. And uh, I was sitting on the step in front of my wife. And there was someone else sitting, sitting with her. And there were announcements. You know, the all-important time in a church service where we have our announcements. And the announcements were going forth. And my wife and her friend were giggling and joking behind me. And I just had this righteous indignation come over me. <laughs> and I turned around. Shh! I let them have it. Like with all the shush I could give them, they got it. Like it was just a full blown, both barrels. And uh, I remember the looks I got. You got to, so I was raised Catholic and you don't yeah. giggle in a Catholic church. You don't talk. You don't say things out loud. <laughs> You're quiet. And uh, so here I have, you know, I had to correct my wife because she's brother. Hey, cause she just wasn't acting right <laughs> on the platform. No less, you know? Yeah. I was spiritual back then. And, uh, <laughs> so I hushed them up because announcements were going forth. And we get back home, and I'm wondering why my wife's not talking to me. My shush was good. Like, <laughs> she thought, I'm going to take this home with me. And uh, so, yeah, she just wasn't talking. I couldn't. I wasn't wrong. She was wrong. <laughs> I was right. With all that was in me, I was right. <laughs> Only to find out later that I was wrong. And that was a tough pill to swallow. And uh, I was thankful. I, I remember this conversation because she was so graceful with me, even though I was very ugly. But she, she uh, realized, you know, where I came from. She realized my background. And she said, you really thought you were right, didn't you? I said, yeah. And... Thank God she forgave me, and 16 years later, we're still married. Bless the Lord. And you never did it again. <laughs> but the truth is, we can think we are so right and still be wrong. We can even think that we have the backing of the Lord Himself and Scripture behind us and still be wrong. So. I hope you've recently read the entire book of Job. We're going to be focusing on that right now. But I, you know, every time I read through the book of Job, it's kind of funny to me. It's interesting because if you were to take the entire book of Job or most of it, if you were just to take that as, at face value, remove all the context from it, mm -hmm. everything that's written in there just about seems true. You know, and if you're not familiar with it, here, here's Job, this man who was pretty much perfect in the eyes of the Lord did no wrong, but had this tragedy of life that hit him. He lost all his cattle, all his servants, all his children. Then his, his body starts falling apart, and his life is just the worst. And so his good friends show up to comfort him and just start accusing him, right? They just start accusing him, and they're using what seems to be truth. What, I mean, when you read it just at face value, out of, I mean, they say things like, listen, Job, God will not reject a person of integrity. Yeah. I mean, that sounds pretty good, right? Yes. Get rid of your sins, Job, and leave all your iniquity behind you. Then things will get better. This is the type of stuff they were saying to him. This doesn't sound too far off. The riches of wicked people won't last. Like trees, they will be cut down in the prime of life. That all sounds good. That all sounds legit, but the context was all wrong. Job's friends saw his loss of cattle, servants, his children, and finally the deterioration of his own body. And they were absolutely convinced that perfect Job had fallen from grace, right. that he had fell out with God. They showed up at his house to set him straight and hopefully find out what he did. They wanted to know, what would you do, Job? We know you did something. They showed up. They stared at him. They wanted to find out where he had fallen and what he had did wrong. And they felt so convinced of their right to speak. Not only by the way Job looked and his overall condition, but also what they felt they knew of God. 
They felt that they had a good idea of who God was and what he stood for. And surely this man standing in front of them had messed up. Man, we've got to be careful not to get that spirit about us. Right. To look at someone at their face value, see their condition, see what they're going through and think, surely, right. surely something, surely they're dabbling in something. We've got to be careful. And we must use wisdom when we speak. You know, if you read through Job, at the end, God heals him, right? Not only heals him, but basically doubles everything that he had before. And, uh, and then what's more is he had Job pray for his friends so that God would not destroy his friends. And so we've got to use wisdom when we speak. Should I really say that? We've got to be careful and we must use wisdom because there is a great power, like my wife taught about two weeks ago, there is such a power in our words. And um, I've always thought it would be interesting if somehow God was able to show us how far reaching our words mm -hmm. were. Like if, if we could look across the span of space and time and see the effect our words have on people and things and events, I think that would be very interesting to be able to see. I mean, I think about, you know, like if you're in traffic and the person in front taps their brakes, right? Everybody behind them just starts tapping their brakes. Right. And I feel that's kind of like what our words can do. It just affects, it's like that ripple effect, right? Just one after the, the other. And so with that much power comes a great responsibility and, and we need to take great care. You know, my, my nine-year-old son, Jackson, he often comes up to me uh, sometimes at inopportune times he says daddy I want to be a builder when I grow up and then I'll run off and I'll come back daddy I want to be a doctor when I grow up I'll run off come back daddy I want to be a what does he want to be I don't know. he wants to be everything right yes. I want to be a ranger when I grow up daddy I want to be I want to be an officer when I grow up and you know depending on my mood Depending where I am in my mental space, you know, I have to be very careful because whether I think it or not, these are very important conversations because to Jackson, great thought and planning has gone into what he just told me. Right. You know, it wasn't just on a whim that he came up to me and said these things. He's thought about this and this makes a lot of sense to him. So depending on my mood and how busy I am, I've got to use great care in my response because... Sometimes my carnal man wants to say, Jack, would you just pick something? <laughs> <laughs> or Jackson, you can't do them both. That's not, that, those don't work. <laughs> right? We get like that because sometimes I'm working on my Sunday school lesson, my trying to be spiritual. My, my son's like, Dad, I want to be a builder. Dad, I want, I want to be a, Dad, I want, Dad. <laughs> right? <laughs> Here I am trying to, uh, write out a godly lesson my kids are interrupting with trivial questions but they're not trivial to him right right so my response to him man jack that you can't do that dude that's not going to work out buddy what's that going to do to him what you know those words that, that those, those words aren't just for right here and now he's going to carry that i'm 39 and it wasn't but a couple of months ago, I talked to someone that I love and trust about a job that I was thinking about taking. And they said, you know, people gotta be, I mean, people gotta be real, real smart to do that job. <laughs> they weren't trying to call me a dummy, but that's kind of the way I took it. And I'm 39, Jackson's nine. But the same person I asked, I asked another question about another job recently, and they told me, you know what? I think you just knocked that out of the park. You, you, you have every qualification. You, and you know what that did to me? I wasn't going to apply for the job, but after they told me that, I thought, oh, yeah, I can do it. I don't feel like I can do it, but they believe in me. Yeah. And so our words mean a whole, whole Man, lot. That's right. They affect others greatly. You know, we, we may feel like we're just giving a benign comment, but... My goodness, they carry a whole lot of weight. That's true. Proverbs 12 and 18 in the Amplified Version says, There is one who speaks rashly, 
like the thrust of a sword. God, I want to read that again. There is one that there is one who speaks rashly, like the thrusts of a sword. That's what our words can do to our children, like the thrust yes. of a sword. My goodness, we have to be careful. Yeah. Not only our children, to our our brother, you know, our peers. That scripture deals. I mean, that's that scripture messes with me. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. And so, I might not get through all of this lesson, but here here's the heartbeat of this lesson. This is what. I have thought about for a long time when, when talking about how much weight our words carry. I didn't realize how powerful my words were, especially in any form of ministry, um, until one day I had a conversation with an elder in the church. She was she was a mother. She had struggling kids, and um, I was a new convert. But for whatever reason, she put her faith in me, and I was back talking with her, and she was telling me about her son. And I told her, I said, your son's coming back to church. He was struggling. He was falling off. And I just told her, I said, your son's coming back to church. And she said, okay, I believe it. And I was like, wait, hold up. Like, <laughs> I've only been in church six months. Like, you sure you want to take my word for this? And these are the words running through my head. But in that moment, I caught a glimpse of how powerful, Brother Roger, my words are to other people. Yeah. Because what I speak, they're going to take it. Yes, right. And so... Should I say this? Maybe. Because that was probably an encouraging thing to her. But maybe we ought to think about it as well. So, this scripture that I'm about to talk about, it makes my heart sink a little bit. And I've struggled with the way I feel about it for, for several months. Uh, but ultimately, I feel like the Lord has allowed me to feel this way about this scripture for my own good. And it's 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 24. And Elisha went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him. And said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the woods and tear forty and two children of them. So I, I don't question Elisha and I don't question God. Uh, but this scripture messes with me a little bit. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a whole lot of context surrounding this scripture. It just, it's almost like an addendum to a bigger story. Uh, so in just a small part of a bigger narrative just a little detail just the third miracle in a series of miracles performed at the hands of Elisha uh, he parted the waters at the Jordan River just like his mentor Elijah then he found out that the water at Jericho was killing people so he threw some salt in it and he healed it. That's the second miracle. Then while on his way to Bethel, he approaches the city and children come out and make fun of him. And curse them. And two she-bears come out and eat them. That's the third miracle. And, you know, it's so easy to think, well, Elisha prayed for a double portion of what Elijah had. And, you know, there's 14 miracles and that's the third one in the series. But oh, wait a minute. Forty-two kids just got ate by bears. What's going on here? And my intent, again, is not to question God or his word. And I obviously cannot speak for Elisha, nor do I want to. But I only know how this scripture affects me. I can only imagine my reaction if I were in Elisha's shoes. Attempting to undo what I just did, you know. Sure, I mean, I was angry. I was, you know, I was on the way to do the Lord's business. Here comes out these pes pesky kids, and they cursed me, so I cursed them back. But apparently my curse was a little bit bigger than their curse. But I'm still alive, and they're gone. Yeah. Again, my, the purpose of this is not to question the Lord or his prophets, but my goodness, what we speak. When we... Amen. 
He cursed them in the name of the Lord. We've got to be real careful what we do in the name of the Lord. Because it can be it can it can prove life, it can prove death for someone, it can encourage, it can destroy. We've got to use great caution. Right. How many times have we responded with anger in the heat of a moment? How many text messages have we sent? And we, like I said, I wish I could just have that one back. And I believe that God provides grace and mercy for just about every bonehead thing we can imagine. But the scripture tells us over and over that our words are not to be taken lightly. If you were to ask me to give an, a brief overview of the book of Proverbs, I would say it pretty much hits on a couple things. One's obeying your parents. Two, staying away from strange women. Three is watching what you say. One third of the book of Proverbs is telling us, be careful the words that come out of your mouth. Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We must measure our words carefully because they carry weight. And again, we have a responsibility for our words. Um, any, you know, we're, we're apostolics. And I feel like the Lord speaks to us. I believe he leads us. I believe we walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. I believe the Lord put us here together to be a benefit and a blessing one to another. And sometimes the Lord may send me to help you or send you to help me. But again, we've got to use care and caution with the way we address certain things. You may feel you have a word for someone. And that's great. And that's needed. If you've got a word for me, I would hope that you would come and share it with me because I might need some help. And if I have a word for you, I pray that I can come to you and, and give you that word and the Lord will be a help to you. But if we have a word that we feel to give someone, we must do it with care and love, especially, especially, especially if it deals with a sin issue. It has to be done in care and love. Amen. Put, your, put yourself in the shoes of the one who you are speaking to or will be speaking to. How would you want that situation addressed to you? If it were you, how would you want someone to approach you about that issue? We've got to use great care and love. Listen, we, we were in youth ministry for four years and we saw some kids do some dumb stuff. And there were some times when I just wanted to chop their legs out from under them. <laughs> but that doesn't work. It's got to be done in care and love. Because the moment I go up to a young person and tell them directly, hey, God showed me what you did. They're done. They're not coming back. They're not trying again. We've got to use care. We've got to do it from love. Paul said, let everything be done in love. So let's say that God does show you something that someone is dealing with, and it's it's an issue of sin. How do you, how do we go about addressing that? How do we go because if God gave it to you, it needs to be addressed. So number one, we need to be sure that it's God who gave you that word. That should go without saying, but it's probably important that we do talk about it. You you need to make sure that it's of God. And that's going to take prayer. And you'll know that by, you know, prayer ahead of time, prayer afterward. Just, just pray and make sure that it's from God and no other source. Because if it's from anywhere but God, it's not going to go well, right? right. Okay, so that's first and foremost. Make sure that it's from God. And then two, we need to seek for understanding as to why God showed you this. If God truly did reveal this to you about someone, he's not just passing along secrets. Our God is not a gossip. He didn't just speak into your ears, I guess. Guess what they're dealing with. It doesn't work like that. No, he's involved you for a purpose. Man, Brother Wade taught some wonderful things last week. And one of the things that I'm carrying with me is that God is not using me 
I'm not simply a conduit for him to flow through. God has partnered with me. That's good. And so he is partner with, partnering with us to help my brother, to help my sister. So God has shown you this because he wants you involved. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. Uh, this is the New Living Translation. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ recon reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he has given us this wonderful message of reconciliation. He got you involved because he is trying to reconcile someone. He is trying to restore a relationship that he has with someone. And he wants you involved in that. Right. So, so, so pray for wisdom that God can show you how to go about helping that person. And helping what you have knowledge of, uh, help them get over that. And so, uh, number three is determine the best path forward. So how can I take this word that God has given me and be a help? When would be the best time to talk with them? You know, believe it or not, not everything has to be done at the altar. Right? right. You know, you God may reveal something to you. But it might not be your responsibility to go pray them through at that very moment. It might not be that responsibility of you to go up to them and say, God, show me. God, show me you're in sin. We're going to pray this out of you right now. We're going we're gonna to burn it out of you. That might. That might not be the best path forward. And I say that jokingly, but, uh, you know, it happens. Yeah. God gave you that word. He gave it to you for a reason. But we gotta we gotta use wisdom. We've got to determine how can I be most effective at helping this individual Amen. with what I know Amen. and what I understand from God. Amen. So maybe, maybe it's a phone call. Maybe you call them after service. Maybe you call them that Monday morning, or you know, call them whenever you, you feel like God's leading you. Maybe you take them out to lunch. You know, use wisdom and, and, and seek out ways that you can best help that person. And then number four, I feel like this is the most important thing, is see it through to the end. See it all the way through. You know, it, again, you're in this for a reason, and that reason is for restoring your brother and sister. So everything you must do must be centered around that theme. Um, Pray with them daily, encourage them, check on them, and let all things be done with love. Uh, you know, if if I would, Brother Craig, if God revealed something to me about you, and I just came up to you and said, hey, God showed me this. Talk to you later. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it would be like me taking my kids and dropping them off in the middle of the woods and be like, I hope you can make it home okay. Exactly. Yeah. You know, no, no, stick, stick. You're in it for a reason. See it right. through to the end. Help them check on them. Make sure they're Amen. doing okay. Amen. Work with them. Encourage them in the Lord. And uh, watch, watch the Lord do something great. So use respon there's responsibility along with our words. We've got to take great care. Is this okay? Yes. All right. Um, so should I really say that? We, we might just need to say it. It may be something that needs to be said. But Sister Tasha, again, it might be something that never needs to see the light of day. And we've got to use wisdom to determine which of the two it is. <clears throat> One thing's for sure, we need to give time and attention to that question. Should I really say that? Um, Pastor said something a few Tuesdays ago that I thought was just a wonderful play on words. He said, dull sickles shred wheat. Man, that was good. Yeah. I can just imagine that in my mind, just that dull sickle just destroying all this this wheat that, that's meant to be the, the product. And uh, so we've got to stay sharp through through prayer and through fasting and through the word of God, living a life of holiness. We've got to stay sharp. So the last thing I want to do is just destroy someone and cut someone, someone up before with what, what I say. <clears throat> Let's be honest, life is tough all by itself, right? right. We've got a 
stay up late for church on Sunday night. We've got to wake up early Monday morning. We've got impossible deadlines. There's sickness, natural disasters. There's death, not to mention COVID-19, not to mention the political climate. There's a whole lot going on. And so it is so easy to be careless with words and conditions like this. Mm -hmm. So we must use care. We must pray for wisdom and we must pray for God to help us speak everything he desires, but also to hold our tongue when we need to. Um, you know, something that I do a lot, I pray a prayer that goes a little something like this. God, don't let me speak anything I shouldn't speak. Lord, I want to declare everything you want me to, but don't let me say anything that I shouldn't. For the most part, that prayer works, but I can be awfully stubborn sometimes. And God can, God can nudge me. I'm about to say it, and he's like, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't shush your wife. Don't shush your wife. It's not going to be good. Don't do it. Don't do it. And man, I just let loose with it. But God, don't let me say anything that I should. And God laid this on my heart this week, but some have hurt family members and friends with words that you've said in the past. Understand that you can still make it right. Understand that you can break this cycle and bring about healing. Uh, you might not be able to be undone, but healing can come. And with the help of the Lord, he can help us restore what was broken in the past. You know, it's true. We can't always go back and fix what we did way back when. But the Lord can help us repair things around that situation to restore the relationship now. And that way the offended party can forgive me for what I have spoken to them. So maybe an, maybe an apology is in order. That's a good first step. Apologies are a good first step. And I, I believe in apologies, even if it's not your fault. If you got a broken relationship, Man, maybe just apologizing to that person just for the sake of restoring that relationship is in order. Pray about it. Who knows what God can do through it? But moving forward, you can speak words that edify. And I really like that word edify. It means to build or the act of building. And I want to close with Romans 14 and 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Our words are powerful. They can, they can move mountains like my wife taught a couple weeks ago, but man, they can hurt people too. Let's be in the business of edifying one another. Roger, God put me here for you. He put you here for me. And likewise, with each and every one of us in this room, we're here to build up and edify. So let's, let's strive to do that. Amen? Amen. 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 Love you guys. Anybody have any questions or comments before we close? Oh, yes. You said something about you know, you have to stop and consider is what you've been, what the Lord spoke to you meant for words. And I think when we talked about the actions speak louder than words, and some people words are important. And I think sometimes we hear from God and it's like, oh, I've, I've got to do something. And we underestimate or I'll, I can't speak for everyone else, I'll speak for myself, the power of prayer. And, and a, that first step of like praying about it before yeah. you speak. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I go to prayer and I'm like, okay, God, you laid this on my heart and I don't know what to say and I don't sure. know what to do, but I'm going to just pray about it. And then he takes care of it. And I'm like, oh, oh, he did that. Like, <laughs> I prayed and it worked. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. sometimes prayer is enough. Yeah. Brother Haygood said something, uh, I mean, it was, it was months ago. He said, the word of knowledge is like, knowing what's wrong with your car but the word of wisdom is being able to fix it yeah right and so you know we may get that knowledge but then it comes time to pray for the wisdom okay how should i go about doing this maybe i don't address the issue at all maybe i just come alongside them and love them and like you said watch god work it out hey amen anyone else yes okay i was gonna say uh, as a teenager when you, you talked about uh i i can't tell you how many times I was hurt by things that were prayed over me by somebody that even ministered that thought they knew what was happening that thought they knew what was best and 
I would have someone that came up, came alongside me that saw that I'd been hurt directly and try to repair that yeah. because they knew it wasn't true. They knew me in the context of what was going on. Right. But I told you recently about me showing up to work uh, at a youth service late because I'd worked all day. And he took it as almost like I was a backslider because I came at the end of service. And he attacked me. I mean, immediately the minister went down and just started doing all this stuff. Well, a, a youth minister's wife saw what was going on and pulled me on the platform and was like, hey, he didn't know. You know, basically coddled me a little bit because I was right. qu quite offended. Mm -hmm. um, but had she not stepped in, I would have thought everybody there believed what he just said. Sure. And stigma is attached to what we say over people, especially in prayer, if someone can hear you, <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes we don't realize that how much weight that is. Um, and that's for everybody, not just because you're a young person, but I, right. I feel like that happens so frequently and they, he thought he was right. You right. know, he, he had no, mm -hmm. but parents can, appearances can be deceiving. And sometimes we don't know what someone's walking in with and we think we know. Um, but it's kind of like Job with his friends is that we're going to pray you through, you know, yeah. we're going to get this right. And it's like, Hey, I haven't done anything, yeah. you know? And I think we don't realize how much that isolates people say things in a way that's redeeming, you know, and you can speak death to sin in the same way, speaking life to, to good things. Sure. You know, if you feel like somebody is struggling with something, you know, if you're not saying it in an edifying way, that seems like you can redeem that person. I feel like that's kind of leaving them, and saying it might not be a word from God, but yeah. we get emotional and we think we see something, yeah. and um, it may not. That might just be us projecting sometimes too. Right. So do it through love. Absolutely. Frank, did you have some? Yeah, um, just for the young marriage, um, you men uh, will think and plan and and study just about as much as you did for this lesson about the right way to say something to your spouse. And it will be wrong, so don't do it. <laughs> write, write that down, young man. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> well, I had to, I had to Did you have something, Ron? Uh, I'll come back to you, Houston. Just real quick, uh, one of the things that the sister Kevin was saying, uh, just to add on what she was saying, if you ever wonder, and, and you see the fog, you pray for someone, and you ask yourself, is this from God? And the best way to answer that question is, if you notice throughout the Bible, anytime Jesus ever addressed anyone, he addressed the sin in their life, then addressed the solution to that sin. Yeah. The woman at the well, he addressed her issue and her sin, and then he said, I am the living water. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if you ever do feel something within you to go to somebody, because I've had that happen to me too, to go speak something to someone, and, and you feel like this spirit of correction comes over you, make sure you follow it up with a solution biblically to what you just addressed. Because what happens in the spiritual, you open a door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. right? And so when you open that door, you now are allowing anything to go into their mind and into their spirit unless you address it specifically through biblical knowledge and understanding and then you can close that door, and the adversary has no room or authority to speak anything other than what the word says. Right. You know, and also, Roger, that wasn't done in the church service. He met with her one on one, and they had a conversation. Right. Wow. Houston, do you have something? Uh, when God reveals something to you about an individual or a situation, He revealed it to you for a reason. Sure. It wasn't just information of like the gospel brother Jacob said but and also follow what Roger said that you need to spend a lot of time in prayer for you when approach that person or that individual because he, he showed it to you for a reason the worst thing that we can do as uh, believers is that we do nothing with it we just take it and just brush it off mm -hmm. so don't brush amen. it off amen amen I agree yes sir brother Wallace uh, if I may I, I realize I'm a visitor here uh, but I'd like to share something if I can. Yes, sir. And that is that we not only need to be careful what we say to others, but what we say to God. I came to the Lord in 1971, and I went to a church, and everybody was raising their hands and praising God, and I wanted to also. But I couldn't. I felt like I had chains about my arms. I couldn't, I couldn't move them, and I wanted to. And on the way home, 
I made a vow to God that I a promise to God that the next week I would go and raise my hands. And you know, I worried about that all week. And came Sunday, my wife wasn't in the church at that time. And uh, so I got up and I said, I, I don't feel too good today. I think I'll just stay home and read my Bible. I was trying to avoid that. And so I did, and I sat down in my chair, and I opened the Bible, and as God would have it, I opened to Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And it says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for God hath no pleasure in fools. Better it is that thou not a spell right. than vow and not pay. And so I, I was really convicted that I had no experience with God, didn't know who he was or anything, but he knew me. Yep. Amen. And when I made that vow, he made sure I was going to keep it. Amen. And so I got up and I told my wife, I'm going to church. And I did, and I went and raised my hand. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to share that. We have to be careful not only what we say to others, but what we vow to God. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. We can stay here forever, but we got to go to church. Let's have a good church today.